Hello, I'm Callum Delieto, editor of HR Grapevine magazine, and today we are here at Edgeware Road to speak with David Fairhurst, the Chief People Officer of McDonald's. Now, the first thing that comes to mind uh, with McDonald's is there used to be such a stigma. I think it has changed, but, um, you know, years ago when you're at school, teachers would say to you like, oh, you know, if you don't get good grades, you're going to end up working at McDonald's and things like that. And obviously that presents quite a challenge for you in terms of your employer brand. So how have you tackled that, I guess? Well, just under 10 years ago, I joined McDonald's from Tesco. Mm. And I remember at the time coming, taking a look at the organization to see whether I wanted to join it. And when I looked at its corporate university and I looked at its training and I met some of its people, I was really amazed by the quality of what was going on inside the organization from a people perspective. Mm. And then when I decided to join the organization, my mum said to me, how on earth can you join McDonald's? <laughs> Uh, and she was uh, facing the same sort of reaction to the media and the reports of McDonald's over the years and its reputation, um, and was asking me about my job. And uh, bear in mind, I was joining the organization as a vice president of the UK business at the time. Mm. And even I was facing the challenge amongst my mum and her friends about why on earth I would join an organization. So I was thinking to myself at, at that point, which is if only people like my mum could see uh, what was really going on inside this organization from a people perspective and the quality of the people offering. And what a great opportunity to try and bridge, if I came in, the perception reality gap. Well, clearly, it was a situation where what was happening inside the business was far better than people outside the business were being led to believe. Mm. And so what an interesting chat. Much better that way around than the other, by the way, which yeah. is <laughs> you know, people believing it's marvellous and it's not on the inside. So it was a great opportunity to try and um, figure out, you know, what did the people strategy need to be? How do we build confidence in this business, in, in what it's good at? And the business is by no means perfect. Every business has got its challenges. But it clearly, there was a perception gap. And so my excitement was coming in to try and get to the point where when I went to dinner parties or when I went back up to Wigan to my mum, that uh, she could understand the qualities and strengths of this organization. And and that's why I joined this organization. Now, those sorts of perception challenges of stacking shelves, of service sector jobs, are not unique to McDonald's. No. And I'm glad to say that McDonald's has made great progress in its reputation over the years, basically by having an evidence-based approach to what it's good at and showing people and helping people judge them differently. Um, but this is a sectorial challenge. Whether you're a retailer, whether you're a restaurateur, there are perception challenges for the whole sector. So I'd like to think that we have helped in some ways the perceptions of people working in the service industry because the service industry is a very important part of the British economy. 10% of the working population of Britain work in this sector. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to respect and celebrate the way that the Americans do. People who serve you uh, in hospitality businesses and I'd like to think in some small way that McDonald's have helped uh, people reappraise their perceptions of people who serve uh, in this sector and the quality of jobs that it can offer. So you've had a lot of recognition globally, not just in the UK, from organisations like Great Place to Work and things like that. Um, and it's not just recent, you know, this, is, this has been ongoing for a, for a number of years now. So how have you helped sort of maintain that high standard and, and also what's the importance of this external recognition for you? Well, external recognition is really important, particularly where the organisation needs to build its confidence, its benchmark that what you're doing is really good and how do you compare uh, with other organisations. So for an organisation that suffered from perception issues like McDonald's, uh, having third party people come in, whether it be great places to work or best companies or, or academics coming in, looking at what we do, judging us, giving us feedback is a great way of benchmarking yourself, but also a great way of improving and continuing to improve the employment offering. And let me explain why that's really important. Um, if I was to go 100 years ago and you wanted to go to America, you would be getting on a ship in the dockyard and be facing uh, a few a few weeks worth of a week's worth of a journey, a horrific journey across the seas uh, in difficult conditions, um, and that's what you'd expect in order for you to get that journey over to America. Now, you, if I was to say to you a few hundred years ago, can you imagine having a tube with wings on it and engines and flying across in six hours to America? You'd yeah. think I'd lost my mind. <laughs> the reality is that would have amazed you 
a hundred years ago. In fact, you'd have thought it was an impossible dream that we could fly in the sky at 36,000 feet and get to America in six hours. Now, when you get on planes, and regular travellers like me do, um, you sit there and you worry about whether you've got your menu choice and what's the media channel, how many media channels can I watch on this plane and and uh, did the uh, did the um, uh, cabin crew were they genuinely smiling at me when I walked on that plane? <laughs> How we've moved on. And the reason I give you that example is because it's what the psychologists call the hedonic treadmill. Is that there is a constant expectation of, of what was amazing, an amazing thought, suddenly becomes the normal. So when you're in the service industry, retail or hospitality type businesses, customers' expectations move on. And they're starting to move faster and faster. So what would have been an amazing thing that maybe Apple produced um, a few years back now becomes expected. You know, be able to, you expect those things. No, customers are like that, but employees are like that. Mm. And the, the reason that I raise this is that what's good um, and what's uh, good, what's, what, sorry, what's exceptional this year is good next year, is average of the year after. So expectations of what of the value that and the relationship with the employer continues to evolve like a treadmill. Mm. It continues to get more and more. The reason that I raise this is when you think about third-party endorsement, if you think about great places to work, the reason that those things are really important is they constantly challenge you on this relationship between the employer and employee about how value is created and how you can continue to do that. So in other words, if all we did as an employer is offer to our employees the sort of relationship and offering of value that we did 10 years ago, that it now would be old hat. Mm. If we stayed still where we are now, then we will become outdated and irrelevant. So we have to constantly evolve. When you bring in third-party people into your organization to take a look, it challenges you on how to continue to evolve your offering and how to continue to create value. What is it that the employees value most about working for you? And how do I keep up with that treadmill of value um, consideration? So that's why third-party endorsement is important, because it helps the continuous improvement of the relationship with employee and employer. In terms of training, uh, more specifically sort of young talent within the organisation, you have Hamburger University. Tell us a bit more about that. Okay, so... Having a, a university corporately is, is nothing new to us. We, we opened our first university in 1961 in a basement, uh, and that's evolved now to the fact that we have a, a central hub university in Chicago, and we now have satellite universities. For example, we have one here in London. We have one in Munich, which uh, covers um, a lot of the European um, needs. Um, and what the university is about is about really a culture of aspiration. So... Mm-hmm. What we have is that people start in our organization and very clearly can see the curriculum that takes you from right down here, even at work experience at uh, school age, through to English and maths, apprenticeships, A-levels, degrees, and onwards and upwards. So we have a brilliant curriculum that goes from here to here that ultimately can get you to the top of the organization. Mm. And supporting that curriculum are not only fantastic training, uh, a fantastic training team, but also, more latterly, a fantastic education team. Because what we've found is that you need to move beyond just purely training into thinking about how to bring qualifications and education more closely with the training delivery that you, you deliver. And then on top of that, we have this fantastic facility, uh, which is a university. If you go to the London University here, as an example, we have 17,500 students a year that go through it. Uh, we teach in whatever language you choose to be taught in. We have a linguist, a linguistic team. We have fantastic facilities. We have very high standards. Um, and in many ways, we mimic the education system. So we, somebody will get honours from that class. Um, uh, there will be very high standards of achievement. There will be people who fail. There will be people who pass. So very high standards of training. That pays off. And the reason it pays off is because as you've got a curriculum that works all the way up from bottom to top, equally our labour needs of talent works all the way through. So, so many people who start off down here work their way up. And indeed, quite a high proportion of our very senior people start off at the bottom of the organization. In fact, a number of franchisees who are currently running their own organizations in communities started off uh, on the shop floor. Mm. So, we actually supply the people that we need through the organization uh, by having a very transparent and very thorough curriculum of development and a very exciting university. 
And it leads me on to a broader point, really, which is one of the things that's very important to me is there is much more, there should be much more of a revolving door between education and employment. So gone are the days when the educators were over here and they read the Guardian newspaper and they didn't really get involved with employers. And employers were over here and didn't read the Guardian newspaper and were um, uh, in a different world. For me, modern thinking is that people can come and go and pass like a revolving door. You know, they might start work whilst they're doing their A-levels and then might go to university, they come back. And there needs to be much more integration between the two sides of education and employment. So the two should be complementary. And that will involve some employers stepping closer to the world of education and some of the education institutions stepping closer to, to the world of employment. Both parties have blamed each other over the years for not being connected. The reality is we need to be big and bold and realise both as educators and employers that we need to work together much closely. Uh, and so gone are the old days of two parallel universes. For me, it's much more of a revolving door. Yeah. So don't be surprised for me in, in seeing training departments become education departments, in seeing much greater connectivity between qualifications and the training that's delivered in the workplace. Uh, and for me, that's a very exciting opportunity. Now, a lot of organisations, uh, their positioning of HR in terms of the overall strategy of the, uh, the business can sometimes, you know, it could be a little bit low down in priority and things like that. But obviously, you seem to have quite a strong people organization and, and, and are driven by the people. So where is, is HR as a function positioned for McDonald's? Well, the problem with a lot of HR functions is it's negative. They talk about negative things. They don't talk about positive contribution. A lot of people, when, they, when I meet them for the first time socially and I say I work for McDonald's, um, 80% of them will ask me about turnover or absence in the first five minutes. Um, we don't have a turnover issue and we've never had absence above 1%. Uh, but it's just interesting that that's mm. the conversation um, and that that's the point of entry. And I think that's a little bit indicative of we're looking at why people leave organisations rather than why they come to organisations. And there is no, there's no doubt in my mind for a service business that's dealing with millions of customers every day that people have to be, you know, the central part of our strategy. We are serving so many people that if our people are going to serve and serve effectively, um, then people's strategy is really core to what we do. So there's no doubt in my mind that that's the way it has to be. But you have to look positively at the contribution that people make as opposed to um, negatively. Um, and I think um, the way in which we organize and ensure that people are a balanced part of our overall strategic thinking is the way in which we manage our business, and it's called a plan to win. So we manage our business through people, place, price, promotion, product, and planet. It's taken me years to be able to sell them. That's a lot of P's. <laughs> together. Um, and what we do is we build a plan looking at each of those aspects that ensures that it's very balanced. So we, as much as we are looking at new product, we are looking at the people dimension as much as we are looking at the restaurant design. And all of those are developed together. And then we look at the interplay of all of those different P's. Planet was the last one to be added, by the way, uh, over the last few years. And so then we look, because they all interplay with each other. So you might change the design of a restaurant. It has an impact on your staff. You might change the till system. It has an impact on your staff. So you look at the whole thing together and you innovate together and you look at the interdependencies and then you create a plan. So the way that we build our plans and our strategies by definition is balanced and by definition has a P part of it. Now I lead the people team, if you like, uh, people P in that sense. At a country level, the HR director would deliver the would would lead the people P team, and on that team would not just be HR people. It would be franchisees, nominate elected franchisees. It would be communications people. It would be marketing people, food development people. So you don't create a people strategy with an HR team. You create the people strategy with an interrelated team looking at the the issue of people or the opportunity of people. And then you look at how people relate to all those other P's. So the way in which we build our plan almost answers the question, which is by definition is integrated in the overall business mm -hmm. approach. It's balanced. It doesn't get forgotten. Um, and it's not subservient to any of the others or more important than any of the others. It's equal to all of the other issues that the business builds. 
And that's a re- it's called plan to win. That's a really important philosophical way in which we develop people's strategy. Now, of course, the HR function are very instrumental in the detail of the people's strategy, but they do not do it as a silo in isolation. And that's very important. 